And then I've got this thing set up. Good morning and welcome to Ag Talk in the Raw, where I talk raw about agriculture and other things that are on my mind. Well, the beginning of the end is here for the high grain prices. I know, I know everybody just hates to watch this channel because of the doom and the gloom, but I'm going to go ahead and drink out of my Missouri cup. Mmm. And we're just gonna we're just gonna talk about it. So, as y'all know, a balloon flew over. The inept asshole in the White House didn't do anything about it. He allowed his generals to talk about it, shooting it down. He, the, I guess, the generals and him wanted it to fly over the the whole continental U.S. of A. and take high quality surveillance video and photographs and send them back to their their friends in Xinjiang, China, uh, Chicha, China, and uh, then shoot it over the ocean where the salt water could destroy, um, basically destroy everything that's that, that it could have held because salt water really, salt water in these things don't work. They don't work. It destroys them. So then, of course, yesterday another uh, incident happened Nobody has said whether it was a balloon. Someone said that it was a drone or something like that flying at 40,000 feet. Now, a drone flying at 40,000 feet, that's, that's pretty impressive. But it flew completely over Alaska before they shot it down in the north, uh, up in the north end of it, where the water is supposedly frozen. But I think that's still salt water up there, and it becomes pack ice, which is kind of like, you know, crystallized mess. Uh, so why does that have anything to do with agriculture? Well, it's got everything to do with agriculture. I said this before, our largest, uh, the largest buyer of commodities, you know, corn, soybeans, wheat, I believe barley as well, goes to China. Uh, it goes to China. Now, the Chinese are still going to have to eat, no matter what. Uh, they're going to have to eat, and if Xi Jinping doesn't feed them, or make sure that they can eat, there will be an uprising in, of biblical proportion within that country. So it's a fine balance. And my opinion is that it all started with Ukraine. You know, Ukraine is, what, 17% of the world's uh, grain? 17% oh, of the world's grain is grown in uh, Ukraine, if I've got that right. Maybe it's wheat or one of the other commodities. It's 17% of either all or... Um, yeah, no, I think it's 17% uh, of that. Now, sunflowers, sunflower, sunflower oil comes from Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine. There's a lot that comes out of there. And uh, why am I talking about that? Well, I honestly do believe that China over here, Russia over here, are working together. So China wants Taiwan. China wants everything in, in the South China Sea. And the Sulu Sea, all that over there, which also includes, um, you know, uh, Taiwan. Uh, I don't think they would make a move on Japan, but uh, the Philippines. So the Philippines is a sovereign nation now, has been since 1947. And in 1992, 92, 1992 was the closing of the Subic Bay and all other military, U.S. military bases in the Philippines. Their government decided that they would not renew the leases. They were 50-year leases after the 50 years of friendship. And there was the 50-year leases of these, uh, the, the U.S. military bases. And the government voted on it and said, you know what? We want the United States off of our shores. So they did. Now, I can honestly tell you that there is U.S. Uh, uh, presence in the Philippines, U.S. military presence in the Philippines, because as you know, I um, have been to the Philippines many times. Uh, my wife is from the Philippines. I love going to the Philippines. It's just this wild place where you feel so free to do whatever you want without repercussion. Just don't kill anybody kind of a place. Um, now, there was a report that the U.S. Um, had retained the right to enter the base if there is the bases. Now, they have not been maintained. But yeah, Subic has been, and I, Clark is definitely a, an airfield, but there's another airstrip out there in Florida Blanca, and uh, 
you know, there's actually nine sites within the Philippine Islands where the U.S. had had a military presence. Um, I was there in 2019 with Joseph. We went up to Mount Pinatubo, and our military was there doing exercises. They kindly asked me not to mention that way back then, but it's been more than three, four years, so I'm going to mention it. Uh, back in 2019, they were doing exercise with 105 uh, 105 millimeter artillery pieces, Black Hawk, Hawk helicopters, 50 caliber machine guns, 30 millimeter and 20 millimeter uh, um, uh, anti-aircraft. They were doing all kinds of stuff, and we got to witness it. It was neat. I was not allowed to film it, which, whatever, that's okay. We got to hear it and see some of it. Uh, drove right past their base, which was quite large was down in that big washout that went down towards Denala Pihan or, uh, yeah, was that Denala Pihan or Bataan? It was down towards Bataan. It went clear across both sides of that country. It's crazy how big that thing was. But, uh, yeah, so what's that got to do with farming? Well, if bullets start to fly, missiles start to fly, and China's instigating it, in my opinion, China's instigating it with balloons and drones. Um, my personal opinion is that they're trying to see what they can get away with and what size of a craft that they can get away with before our surveillance systems pick it up. Uh, I don't think that we're going to miss much other than maybe things that are the size of this phone, but I don't know. Uh, I've seen pictures uh, from satellites or orbiting things that uh, can read the names on golf balls that lay on a golf course. Yeah, that good. Not just a license plate. Facial recognition uh, and all that stuff. So, you know, that's just that's just what we have. Maybe they have it too. Who knows? Uh, my personal opinion is, why did they send a balloon? Well, I'm going to give you my personal opinion on that. Um, I think they sent a balloon because it, the balloon, it's quiet, doesn't make a lot of noise, kind of mysterious. Uh, I think it was a test for an EMP to see if we would spot something like that, even the little drone that they are supposedly shot down. At least the F-22 is getting used. Uh, I guess it's been twice they've used the F-22. Uh, but if you don't know, uh, Barry Sotura, aka Barack Obama, he uh, quit building. He shut down the F-22 Raptor uh, you know, F-22 Raptor uh, airplane, fighter plane, because they favored the F-35 over the F-22. Well, the F-35 is basically a, uh, an improved version of a Harrier jump jet, uh, and the uh, <coughs> the uh, the F-22 Raptor was at the time and possibly still is the most technologically advanced fighter plane ever to be built. Uh, and flown and maintained. Now, I don't know how many they made. I know they're extraordinarily expensive, but I think they're going towards the drones, one unmanned air, aircraft. Um, in my honest opinion, I think they better ramp up production of both F-35s, F-22s, and uh, Super Hornets because, according to some folks, and the unrest in the, in the East like Europe, Eurasia or Asia, they are um, getting a little nervous about China. And we keep buying their crap, right? We keep buying their crap. Well, we need to stop buying their crap. And if we do stop buying their crap, that means that the grain markets are going to crash. They are. But we don't have a president in the office that would be willing to uh, take on the Chinese Communist Party in a way like that. Uh, they still have to eat. So we might be protected there to a point, or that may be used to our advantage, because let's just say if they do take over Taiwan, we can't, we can't defend Taiwan. We're not legally obliged to take, all, take care of Taiwan. It's just not in our deck of cards. Um, Taiwan became a sovereign nation after Japan was kicked out in 1945. 
So Japan took Taiwan from China in 1895. I want to say it was 1895. A little history lesson here. Uh, they were on their way to uh, they were on their way to the Philippines, but there was this little thing going on called the Spanish American War in 1898. And it hadn't gotten there on time. They could have possibly defeated the Spanish, but the Spanish were still a formidable foe at that time. And the Japanese were more interested in other parts of, you know, their ring of fire. And uh, they just really didn't, they didn't want to get involved with that just yet. They probably could have teamed up with the U.S. and fought together and maybe got uh, the Philippines away from uh, the Spanish and kept it for themselves. But I don't think the U.S. was interested in that at the time because they were already in a 50-year war or a 40-year war invasion for, um, for uh, commodities uh, uh, and uh, energy. Energy was what they were after. Energy and steel and other metals and things kind of like what's going on in China right now. So this this thing that's going on with Taiwan, if this happens while the inept one is still in office, uh, the, uh, the Chinese will be at war with China because that idiot will, even though it's not an obligation, he'll probably do something stupid because that's what Joe Biden does best. Now, when it comes to the Philippines, that's a whole other story. Um, at the end of 19, the 50-year the friendship in 1947, at the end of 1947, the, uh, there was an agreement between the Philippines and the United States that if there was ever to be unrest again and someone was trying to invade or to take over the uh, Philippines, take it away from the Philippine government, that the United States would come to their defense and they would fight. So there's still that. Now, China has already pushed that limit. We have ships in the area. We are there, whether anybody wants to believe it or not. Uh, but if, the, if China does decide to invade the Philippines, we will be at war with China over the Philippines. That will just be a fact. Uh, that'll screw things up for me because I have interest there. My wife's family is there. Uh, we have a property there and it would just be a mess. So I don't know that China's willing to do that just yet. I mean they're pushing the envelope. They started building uh, an island, a bigger uh, military island on top of an island that was Philippine territory and the island sank because it's sand. I mean, there's coral there, but not in that island. Anyway, uh, I just think that we've got a year, possibly two, with higher grain prices. That's just my, my opinion. That's what I see for the future. So, guys, if you're, if you're planning on spending, like, millions of dollars to update your equipment because we've got $650 to $750 corn and, you know, $12 to to twenty dollar beans uh yeah you're 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 gonna be in for some trouble uh unless you can turn those back in uh, buy used equipment if possible if you need it real bad but uh, my opinion is to hold back don't get in it too deep because once that war starts and this idiot wants it I really miss Donald Trump. I like peace in the world. I liked peace treaties, not threats of war. Uh, and there's a lot of folks out there that just hated Donald Trump so bad that they would rather send their children to die in a war in a far off land than actually have a guy that had this country's uh, best interest at heart. And there's a lot of people that don't believe that. Uh, they think that Donald Trump was the worst person ever to have in the office, uh, the, in the Oval Office. And those are the people that watch certain television programs. Um, you want to get the real news, you got to actually get the real news. Now, you can get the real facts on YouTube if you look hard enough. Like, instead of tuning into CNN or MSNBC and watching 
a Donald Trump speech, um, you can go to YouTube and watch that speech in its entirety. But 99% of people don't want to do that uh, on, the, on the other side. And I, I strongly suggest they do it. Because if you're watching just the news channels, you see Donald Trump kind of do this and this instantly. That's called an edit. And they've gotten really good at morphing those edits. Uh, you can do it through YouTube or actually Adobe, um, you know, Photoshop. And uh, is it Adobe? Yeah, it is. Adobe Photoshop or even my um, Final Cut Pro on Apple. You can, you can take an edit and actually make my head turn, my body move, even though it's a cut, you can do that and you can do away with the edits. It just doesn't look like there was an edit. You would have to have a trained eye to see it. And most people are like Gerg from the freaking, uh, I don't know, <laughs> the cavemen days. They just, oh, Donald Trump's looking a little fidgety out there. <laughs> I guess that's all he's going to say is you know, the Democrats suck. Well, the Democrats do suck. <laughs> that's that's just a fact. AOC, uh, take a look at that dumb broad. Uh, she's really good at social media. That's why she's popular. She's like a she's so far she's a two term. I don't know if she won her third. Is she on her third term? Yeah, she's probably on her third term. Hmm. One, two. She's a she's, yeah. Next election, I think she has to she has to run again. But most senators and congressmen and women do not have this, this big aura around them making them, you know, like these superstars. But because of these things and social media and a soapbox where she can spout hate, she does spout hate, um, yeah. I love it when I watch the State of the Union address and, you know, when I'm watching Newsmax, which is the news, uh, even OAN, the news part of OAN. I don't like the talking heads. I want to see the news. I don't like, you see, that's that's what I watch the news for, to get the actual news. I don't, I, these talking heads are these opinion people. And most of, most of these things, like The View, like even Sean Hannity, they're opinion people. They're opinion people. They project their opinions. <clears throat> so there's no accountability on what they say because it's just their opinion and everybody has a right to it. So go to Newsmax or OAN, watch the news. They will give you what actually happened, what actually was said, and what actually is going to happen. And none of this CNN opinion pieces. Don Lemon or Lamone or whatever the hell you want to call that guy, I think he's off now. And there's a lot of different people. They're just opinion pieces. You have to look and look up the facts. Watch a Joe Biden speech, not an edited one, a full-fledged Joe Biden speech. That is where, how you're going to be. Um, if you don't watch a full Joe Biden speech uh, and you only get the edited parts, he's brilliant. I mean, he just, he doesn't go, he doesn't do that in those. So, and that's. Also on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, that's they edit they edit that crap out so that he doesn't look like an eighty year old dude that's got cognitive decline. I mean, we're we're on we're it's dementia, Joe. There are signs of dementia. One of them is you walk like this because you're unsure of where you're going and where you're at and what's going. You know, in case you fall, you're like. So you see him constantly. When he goes to leave the podium, he's confused. He's like, okay, I can still read, but now i got to walk. Just watch that stuff. You'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, I think they need to vote in age limits to the presidency. You know, once you hit 80, you're done. I mean, 80 years old. What the fuck do you want to be doing that job at 80 years old for? I mean, I would rather have my uh, my four and a half year old run the country rather than this guy. At least he's got the energy to do it. And I love when he goes to run. He just looks like a bunch of sticks that are on a string. You know, he's a puppet running down the freaking gangplank. You know, like don't run, Joe, because you fall, you're breaking.
But anyway, so that's a, that's my opinion on the uh, where we're going. Uh, there's another thing, and I think it was the last video that I did on here, and I talked about it's coming. You know, it's coming. The regenerative ag thing, like what I've started to do, what I'm going to continue to do, what I've been criticized for doing, and what I've been commended for doing. There's a lot of guys that said, hey, you know, if that works out for you, you're going to make a lot of money. Well, money can be made and money can be lost. Um, I was in the mistake phase. I will probably make mistakes in this for several years. Hopefully, and hopefully, that the mistakes that I make are um, noted and I won't do it again, <laughs> you know, because mistakes are expensive in agriculture. You can screw up pretty bad. Uh, I screwed up. I'm going to admit it. I screwed up with the last 250 acres of corn that I planted. Uh, the first 600 or the first 400 acres were, they weren't perfect. The first 200 acres were perfect. Just 250 acres. The first 250 acres were perfect. I, I was sitting high on the hog, baby. I mean high on the hog. Then I got into... You know, so 250 acres were perfect. Then I got into the next 100 and some acres that I planted. I guess it's going to be about 150 acres. So we're at three, 400 acres. You know, 400 acres. Those were, eh, I could have done a better job here. I could have done a better job. I, 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 I could have, I could have at least ran this stuff down with the roller hara. Um, so what happened when I planted that was I didn't roll it down. The first that I planted, we were still getting rain. It was, uh, the grass was still actively growing, you know, because I planted through hay crop. Uh, the, the grass was actively growing. I was, we were still getting some rain. And through May, we only got like, I think the most we got in May was like an inch. But it was, the problem was we get two tenths, three tenths, two tenths, three tenths. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot when you've got, uh, you're in a no-till situation and we had gotten inches of rain preceding the planting. So I had to be really careful because I needed my sidewalls, my trench to be crumbled and, and two tenths of an inch was enough to just make it so that it wouldn't crumble very good. And I, it took me time. So we were still getting rain and the corn so I've got a hay crop that's like three feet tall. It's all three feet tall at this point. I didn't roll it down. And I, I wish I did. I wish I had a, a way of rolling it down at that time. <coughs> but I didn't. I do now. But I didn't then. So what happened was the first that I planted, it came up and it got real leggy. You know what leggy is? Thin tall, straggly looking stalks. So when corn is competing with itself, uh, all other, you know, that's why emergence is so important. Corn can become its own weed. So if you've got, say you're planting a 35,000 plant population or 34,000 plant population, and you've got 95% of your corn came up together. Three percent of the corn came up a day to two days behind that. That's going to be okay, but that two percent that that didn't quite catch a root and go, whether it was from air pockets because you didn't crumble your sidewalls correctly or whatever it may be, uh, those are going to become weeds. They're never going to grow evenly together, collecting the sunlight. They're always going to be in competition with the stuff that grew, started to grow, you know, four days ahead of it. It will never produce much of anything. You'll get a little nub in here or something like that. Um, so that's those, that, that 2% that's all leggy like that. That's what all my corn looked like in the beginning. It was competing for sunlight with the standing grass that was in there. Well, while we were still getting rain, it was okay because it had enough of a root mass to continue to fight for light and 
it was really weird because once that corn canopied over top of the hay, got up above the hay, the standing hay, and started to canopy, it stopped growing up and it started putting roots down. So the corn that was planted, say, I think it was on about the 10th or the 12th of May, that was when I started because of the wet weather, uh, that corn did really okay. It was leggy, it got up above the hay, and then it started to girth, the stalk started to get a little girthy, the roots started to go down before it started to really shoot up. But the later, what is that? That's hair. I thought it was dirt. <laughs> uh, the later planted uh, corn, that was the last that I planted, the last 200 acres that I planted were planted when the conditions were perfect. The slots opened up nice, the closing wheels crumbled them beautifully, but they still had to fight for light. They had a hell of a canopy because the hay had grown to its full potential by that point. It was all headed out. It was three feet, three and a half feet tall, and it was had the thick stems because it had gathered all the nitrogen, a lot of the nitrogen that I had put into the soil onto the corn crop. It had gathered all that and it was not wanting to die. If you remember those videos, you would know that I had to spray that twice to get it to die. And that sucked. Partially my fault. I was using an air induction nozzle to spray Roundup with. Wrong thing to do. The reason was partly laziness and partly I didn't want to spend the money on a, uh, a flat fan uh, spray nozzle or a double fan spray nozzle that would make a finer mist. I wanted to be able to spray in wind and I wanted to spray fast and I wanted to get it done. Well, that was my fault as well. Even though I did have a good kill, it took twice. And I probably didn't even have to spray it twice but because it was what... My, my agronomist, he said, That's, I call that the living dead. That grass is the living dead. It's rotted off. It had a brown spot right at the base of the stalk, but it was so healthy that it was, it was skipping that part, pulling moisture up. So he had that, and it was taking moisture out of the ground, a lot of moisture out of the ground. We cannot have a lot of moisture out of the ground when we're headed into a drought. So that's what had happened. It was pulling moisture it wasn't dying. The corn was leggy, like really thin, spindly stuff. And then the faucet shut off for four weeks. What was it? 19 days. So that would be almost three weeks. 19 days. And then we had like, I think we had three or four tenths of an inch. That was it. And then it was another 22 days. So 22 in 19, we're looking at 40-some days with literally no rain. The first corn that I planted had made it. It was canopied. It would curl up, but it would unfurl at night. Like the minute the sun went down, it would unfurl. So it was getting moisture. It had a root system under it that would that was able to keep going deeper and pulling moisture up. And I was pleased with that. The later stuff, man, it was Badass. You could see some of the pictures on Instagram. You could see the videos that I put on YouTube on One Lonely Farmer, what that corn looked like because I it was competing with the hay, the standing hay for sunlight. So we're not going to have that problem. Even though now on all this ground, I will be putting corn on every single acre I had corn on last year. Every single acre I had corn on last year will have corn on it again this year because of the herbicide. Uh, the residual herbicide in a drought year does not break down. And that atrazine, uh, I'm a little worried about that atrazine and putting soybeans in behind it. Now I've got wheat on there and the wheat looks okay. It looks all right. It's got some purpling to it, which is not what it should be doing. Uh, the wheat that was planted on the soybeans is the best the wheat that was planted on the corn is the worst. So every acre of corn that I had will have corn again because of the herbicide. We do have cover crop on it as well. So before I plant that corn, I will be laying it down. 
so that it doesn't compete for sunlight. And I've said that about a hundred times. It's very important. I don't have a roller crimper. I bought a vertical tillage machine. Great Plains Turbo Max 2400. That would have been, it's, it's going to be okay. Uh, I'm going to have to have Teresa out running that thing at a high rate of speed ahead of the corn planter so that I'm never behind. So that I'm never behind because that new corn planter, 60 feet wide. 60 feet wide traveling at five and a half mile an hour. Possibly six and a half mile an hour depending on what it, how it's dropping that seed and closing up those those furrows. So those, you know, the, the slots seed trench. So she's going to be doing that. Uh, it's going to be a busy spring, trust me, because 60 feet wide, we're going to be planting a lot fast. Uh, there's going to be, I'm going to have to, I got to see if uh, I can, I'm going to need help for that though, because there's going to be a seed truck going to have to be chasing my ass down because 24 rows, three bushel boxes. Yeah, I'll be able to go a long time with those, but when I need seed, it's going to be a lot. I need 96 bags at a shot. At the least, 48 bags. Yeah, 48, 24, 48, right? And, yeah, 90. Isn't that 96? All right, hold on. Let me get my brain out here. Sometimes, doing math, some, and it's kind of early, so 24 times 3. 72, sorry, sorry. 72. Eh, well, it might take... Might take 96 just to fill it up. Depends. It's a three bushel, and most bags of seed are not a bushel. They're much less, you know. You'll get a 42 pound bag, 45 pounds. Um, when you get the big rounds, then maybe you'll you'll get the uh, you'll get up to you know 55, 52 pound bags. But it's going to take at least 72 bags to fill that thing up to go again. You know, and of course there's going to be the guys. Oh, you should have got your center fill. You know, the center fill one. No, it's fine. So this is going to lead me into what I said on the last video, how it's coming. This is coming. Regenerative ag and cover crops are coming whether you like it or not. There's a lot of guys, and I think the guys in the Midwest are going to be like, fuck you, I need to have 325 bushel yield in order to make any money. Um, but they have a hard time. They don't have a hard time doing this. Push this pen. Push a pencil. Just do it. If you have a reduction in yield and a reduction in the input cost because you're doing this, see that? The furrow? Change. Change is coming. When you see magazines that look like this, that means that it's coming whether you like it or not. So let's see what it says for the cover. There's a um, our story. Does that say the cover? We know the science of weed resistance. We have the tools to reduce nutrient loss or to plant cover crops. So why is it so difficult to get traction on making changes on the farm? Perhaps the biggest help can come from just connecting with others, i.e. the internet. So my whole trek down regenerative ag, I have researched a lot of this. I've researched it through Google. I've researched it through YouTube. And I have researched it mostly Google and YouTube. And now I'm going to have these magazines and sorts of things. And I will read through them to see whether it's, uh, you know, whether I've learned this already or not. Let's see, tackling change. Change is inevitable. Sometimes it's welcome, sometimes it's messy, and everyday farmers are faced with changes coming at them from every direction. Just like people in other industries, farmers face changes in technology, labor availability, regulations, and more. Not to mention the changing weather and unforeseen person, personal or family shakeups. Oh yeah. This month we're sharing the stories of farmers and other agriculture advocates who faced changes with positive attitude and got positive outcome. Likely not a coincidence. Our cover story addresses the psychology of making changes on the farm. Our agents of change stories highlight those em 
embracing the changes they see on the horizon, including a first-generation farmer enthusiastically facing unfamiliar territory and a poultry farmer whose vision is boosted and with boosted the financial welfare of nearly 100 farm families. Our team now articles look at some of the favorite past furrow projects, including the family of five young girls who lost their parents way too early, but have flourished since they first told their story. These last few years, we've seen more change than any of us probably anticipated. It's my hope that it's left us in a position to be more adaptable, more accepting, and ready to tackle the next round of changes coming our way, whatever they may be. Okay, best regards, Ann East, content marketing strategy manager for John Deere. So, they wouldn't put cover crops on the face of this book just because it looks pretty without the change. So change change is, is inevitable. Uh, a year ago I sat through a meeting and that meeting was at the New Jersey Soybean Board and they were talking about the modes of action of herbicide and how they are becoming less and less effective on weed control. And I thought well okay it's been a few years, it's been a minute since I had been to a meeting. My dad had gone to the meetings I didn't. I'm a hay farmer. What the fuck do I need to go to these meetings for? And honestly, I'm glad that I hadn't gone in all these years because you can spoon, fold some, spoon feed a person a little bit of poison every day for years before it has, the, you know, before they would notice it. If you gave them a cup full of poison, they'd die pretty quick. They'd get sick and they would die. They wouldn't notice, you know, they would notice pretty rapidly. So in the last seven years or so that I hadn't gone to a meeting, in those seven years I hadn't gone to a meeting of any, yeah I guess it hadn't been that long, it's been a while, <coughs> I hadn't gone to that meeting, maybe five years, I hadn't heard any of this stuff. And last year I went and I was like, you know, this change that I'm embracing and, and, and gonna do, might be an intelligent path to take. So, what are the conventional guys going to do when glyphosate misses more weeds than it kills? What are the conventional guys going to do when they pull, I don't know, conventional, the old 2,4-D off the market, and now you've got to use Banville or, or Clarity or, you know, whatever the heck it is, Callisto to do those jobs. Well, they'll use them, but there's drift and there's volatility and there's problems with that stuff. So you gotta, you gotta adapt and change. Or you could do this, you could do this change thing, cover crops. So what do cover crop, what will cover crops do for you in the weed control? Well, it's biomass. Now you can't till it in. You're gonna have to well, you can, but you're still going to have the problems with your weeds. Just a fact. You're going to be controlling weeds with herbicides that are increasingly becoming less effective. And the next new line of herbicide that will be on the market isn't going to be on the market for a minimum of 7 to 12 years. So in 7 to 12 years, in the 7 years that I hadn't gone to a meeting... The tone had changed. Oh, Roundup coupled with Callisto or whatever to take out your mare's tail and your, your well, at that point, ragweed wasn't, wasn't on the list of resistant weeds, but it is now. And I don't know why, but I planted soybeans and that farm hadn't had soybeans on it for several years and I never had a ragweed problem, but I planted those beans and ragweed came out of my ass. It just came everywhere. And... Two, four, or Roundup glyphosate at a high rate didn't do anything. Just it laughed at it. I had to go back in with what was it? Um, was it Callisto? It was yeah, not Callisto. Was it Callisto? I think it was Callisto. And uh, it 
It took them out then. Where did that seed come from? Why was it resistant to Roundup? Uh, kind of baffles me. Home farm. We never had Roundup resistant anything on that home farm because it's been hay for the last 10 years. It had been hay for like 10 years. The corn, there was no, there was no weeds that I couldn't control at, on the home farm. Last year I had soybeans. I had Roundup resistant mare's tail. Never had mare's tail on that farm ever. But I got it now. I got it now. Pissed me off because I think it came in the seed. I think it came in the soybean seed. So how else would you, uh, how else would you uh, sell more chemicals if you didn't have a weed problem? Right? Can't prove it. I don't even want to prove it because I've got an idea. And the idea is to, to do this. It's to change. Simple. Ch how do you change? You just get a mindset that you're going to do something. You know, the first, the hardest part of a thousand mile journey is stepping outside your door. Right? It's opening up the door, taking that first step. So you have to do that. And the first step in this is to research. And believe me, I did a lot, a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm still researching it. Every day I'm listening to this idiot box through my hearing aids on how I'm going to make this work for me so I can cut out a lot of inputs so that I can make a good dollar, right? I think that's this change is a key to my expansion in this business here in New Jersey because if I can cut out my input costs, cut them down, I can get better ground as it becomes available and rent it because my profit margins will be like this, not like this. So this change also will change your uh, drought tolerance, will make it much more drought tolerant. So anyway, that's, that's the direction that we are going here. Uh, I will be putting on spring cover crops to be planted the first week of June. Last week of May, first week of June. I will be putting in these cover crops at the end of March, spinning them on, VTing them in, sayonara, see you in a month and a half. It'll be a huge amount of biomass that I will lay flat. Now, what the laying that flat does, okay. So, everybody's like all up in arms about my vertical tillage machine. Oh, you're tilling the soil. You're not no till. You're tilling the soil. Okay. The, the most important thing about laying down cover crops is to get it to, to lay down, to die, to hurt it and die. You can do that a couple of ways. One is a roller crimper. Okay, roller crimper. So a roller crimper is just a gigantic roller. Expensive as hell. So like for a 30 foot roller crimper, you're looking at 40 grand. It's heavy and it's got a chevron looking pattern to it so that when it rolls it, it breaks the stalk and causes it to die and we're, that's for um, that will be for the, uh, the the rye the wheat and the cover crop that's that's what that's for it is not a hundred percent effective so you're still gonna have to go back in with glyphosate or sulfosate or something like that to kill it atrazine if you need to uh, all right there it is Roller crimping. So I decided that I would buy a vertical tillage machine because I wanted to plant the cover crop very quickly and I can't do that with a roller crimper. Uh, I do have the option to angle blades and actually loosen the upper part of the soil and <coughs> till in that wheat or cover crop, rye, cereal rye, wheat, cover crop, whatever I'm putting out there with my vertical tillage machine. Or I can run it in straight slices, slice the ground about that deep and uh, that'll chew up the cover crop a little bit and it will hurt it and it will also lay it flat so that I can plant through it so when I come through with my herbicide whether it's a burn down 
and my residual or just a burn down and the cover crop is the residual. Now, rye, wheat, oats, uh, what else has allelopathy? Allelopathic effect. Look at a sexy girl. How you doing? Yeah, I love your long hair. You're so pretty. I know he's got a fever. I felt that this morning. So the allelopathic effect basically is natural weed control. It is. Uh, I wouldn't recommend not putting a res residual down on your first go around. I am not going to. I did last year. I will do it again. Uh, you can do it at a reduced rate or the minimal minimum rate, saving money. That's the whole point in this. So, okay, now you've got to plant through this crap. There's a lot of people out here, well, I got it. Blah, blah. You're never going to punch through that stuff. Disc blades, disc blades, disc blades, disc openers, brand new, brand new, brand new. Buy them, put them on. It's cheaper than a quart of glyphosate, twice, you know. It's cheaper than, you know, all your residuals. It's cheaper to do that than to buy a disc hair or high-speed disc or chisel plow points and all this stuff. It's cheaper to do that. Buy disc openers. So what does that biomass do? All right, so I take the biomass. I've got it green. I put my fertilizer down a week in advance, and that's what's going to happen. My nitrogen will be applied a week in advance. The, the cover crop will be like, yay, food, let's go. All right, that's the point. Put that fertilizer on a week in advance. All the cover crop is going to say, "Yes, I've got this made in the shade. I'm going to go to I'm going to go to vegetative state, and life is going to be good." And it will. It's going to green up and grow like a mother. And it's going to grow like hell. Then you're going to plant through it. You're going to plant through it. You're going to wait until that seed is germinated and ready to come through the ground, and then you're going to kill it. You're going to kill it then. That's when you're going to kill it. You'll be like, okay. So what that has done is we have put the fertilizer down. You spend four or five days. Vertical tillage is going to come through. Lay that shit flat. Tear it up. Isn't going to kill it. We don't want to kill it yet. It may kill a percentage of it, but it's going to hurt it. It's going to act like a mechanical cow in my vertical tillage machine. Now a roller crimper will lay it flat and you know possibly kill it 85-90% and you're still gonna have to go through with Roundup or whatever to kill it. Uh, the vertical tillage machine same thing but it's gonna chew it up and it's gonna trigger a response in those plants. Uh-oh I've been chewed on I need to recover and it's gonna exude sugars, carbohydrates and all that other wonderful stuff into the soil and sequester the microbiology to get it what it needs to recover that plant. So it's kind of imperative that you do this a couple days before you plant. You really want to do this a couple of days before you plant. Lay it down. Things are getting funky. Two days before you plant, a day before you plant, whatever it is. If time doesn't, doesn't allow you to do it, do it anyway. Do the best you can. Uh, yeah, you can do that. You can actually plant the crop and then lay it flat. I don't recommend it. Uh, I don't think that it's, you know, because then it's, you still got that competing to get up through that canopy. I say lay it flat. It'll cut nice slots and it'll be sem somewhat clean in the slots that you've cut and you'll be good. All right. Then you're going to kill it as that plant comes up. So the whole point is to get the cover crop, whatever it is, whether it's hay cover, uh, wheat, rye, barley, whatever you put out, oats, multi-species from last fall or the spring, that's whatever you do. Lay it flat, plant through it. Three, four days later, come through and spray it. Spray it with your burn down and your residual. The reason for that is you need to get that stuff to die. Now, it is flat. It is laying down. Your corn, your soybeans, or whatever are coming through. They're coming through it within days of going, growing, you know, they're doing it. Uh, if there's rain on the forecast, 
and you plant it today and there's rain on the forecast tomorrow, get that sprayer out there for your residuals to get worked into the soil to, you know, because it's got to work into the soil in order to work on the ungerminated seeds. <coughs> the allopathic effect of the rye, wheat, barley, oats, whatever it is, is going to work on those weed seeds as well. Plus the soil temperature where those over the top of that is never going to get high enough to trigger a response from those weed seeds. When the rain falls, it's going to hit the biomass first, break up into smaller, smaller particles, less impact on the soil, less crusting, if any crusting. It isn't going to seal off the soil because when rain hits it, it just does this and soil bounces all over the place. It bounces up on your soybeans and then you've got white mold and other diseases that can come from it. Aphids, you know, and all that other crap is going to fly in there, but they're not because your soil is protected. The worm holes do not get sealed off. Any of your, any of the, the roots that the root masses from the year before his crop and even this cover crop are still there. They're spongy, they're porous, and the water will go down in there. And instead of it evaporating off or running off, it will be in your soil, extending that period of time in the event of a drought. So, very important. If you go out and you work a field, you work it, and there's nothing more satisfying then going out, taking a piece of land, turning it over, chisel plowing it up, working it down or working it up, depending on where you are in the country, with a disc harrow, going through, roller harrowing it or rolling it out, or just skipping the roller harrow part of it and using a finishing tool, whatever it is, and then planting it, seeing this perfectly beautiful, freshly prepared seed bed, planting your crop, watching it pop up in rows, and then realizing that, wow, this is great, but I haven't had rain in a few days. Okay, whatever. And then we get a gully washer. You sprayed your corn. You get a gully washer. And the guy that did the no-till down the road, he has nothing coming off of his field. There's very little water running off. There's, you know, looks good. Yeah, it looks kind of a mess because you've got a mat of crap and what a half-assed farmer that guy is. But then you look at the, the field that's, you know, up on the hill that was chisel plowed and worked down, worked up, whatever, done, prepared, professionally done. This dude spent no, spared no expense. He has burned every drop of diesel fuel he possibly could to get that soil in the condition to make it so that that corn will pop up out of the ground within nanoseconds of one another. But then a gully washer happens and you've got a few things happening now. Now you've got ditches that are running full of mud. Your herbicide that you put on that was only, you know, right at the very top, like a razor blade's thickness that hadn't gotten worked in by a nice gentle rain. Down the ditch, into the streams and creeks, polluting that, and out into the rivers. I'm sounding like an organic guy, but I'm not. Um, and three quarters of a ton of topsoil ran off of every single acre that you had out there, along with a lot of fertilizer. But the guy up the road who made a mess, right, he put his fertilizer on a week before he planted um, the, the growing cover crop, stole all of them nutrients that he put down. Oh my God, how can that happen? That idiot, that idiot, he fed the, he fed the weeds. Look at that mess that he made. Well, what is this? What is this? Right. This is a storage device, right? Storage device. And when I want to get what's on here out, I take it and I put it in the back of the computer and boom, my computer explodes. It says, hey, you've got something there. That's what your cover crop is. That's where your nutrients are. That's where your nitrogen is. Now, I've talked a little bit about CEC. It's a cation exchange capacity. Cation exchange capacity can vary in your soil from 1 to 20 uh, in that range. 20 being the best, 1 being the worst. So what does that mean? What does that do? Well, cation exchange is really the storage facility for the fertilizer that you're putting on your barren ground. 
So you've got this barren soil. Your cation exchange is five. Five. All right, well, that sounds pretty okay. You know, it's better than zero. Uh, five, two times five is what? You know, it's, just, it's four. Uh, two times five, five is 10. So 20 times five is 100. 100 units of nitrogen is all that that soil will be able to hold when you put it on. So if you're like, okay, I need, I'm going to grow 300 bushel corn and my cation exchange is only 100, I'm, I need a unit to 1.2 units per acre or a pound to 1.2 pounds of nitrogen to the acre to achieve my 300 bushel corn crop. I have to enter this field three times at a three plus times to get the amount of nitrogen into that plant to grow that corn because when you you say, all right, well, I'm just going to do a split app, 150 pounds each time. Um, volatility, runoff, loss. So you put your 150 units on, doesn't matter whether it's, if it's slow release or not. Uh, I would suggest ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate or uh, liquid nitrogen or urea incorporated into the soil if you're going to go that route. Uh, CEC is very important. So I'm going to put 150 units on now and then I'm going to come back in when I do my, uh, my, my residual application at V3 or whatever and then I'm going to put another 150 units and I should be good. You've wasted, you've probably wasted because you've probably wasted a hundred and that second application without ever even knowing it. Because if you put 150 units on and it's there, you incorporated it in, you know, fine, whatever, the microbes are doing their thing, breaking it down, making it available for your corn crop to grow. Uh, but we get a gully washer or the, it's hot and moist and the sun is baking this stuff. It's just gone, hello, goodbye, gone. No, 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 nothing available there. But if you put a cover crop down, you can put your 150 units of nitrogen down, right? Volatility is going to be very low because the temperature of your soil is going to be very low because it's not barren. Uh, that grass or all the cover that you've put in there is now saying, hello, I want this nitrogen. Your soil still only has the capacity to hold 100 units. But if you put 150 to 180 units of nitrogen down, those plants are grabbing that quicker than it can go volatile. You may lose some. You probably are going to lose some, but the vast majority of it's going to be picked up by the the cover crop. All right. There's people that are saying that it's 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 gone, it's wasted, you've lost it, you've lost it. You haven't lost shit. It's there. It will become available later in this growing season. It will become available. Listen, it will become available later in the growing season. So you kill off your, your cover crop. It's nice and green. It's broke down phosphate and potassium, You've got some zinc and whatever else it needed, you know, uh, whatever else it needed, boron is in that plant, that cover crop. And it's, that is my storage device. Nitrogen of the 150 or 180 units of nitrogen, this, this this cover crop, depending on how much you've got, if you don't have any uh, legumes in the soil producing nitrogen, uh, then you know that's the only place you're going to get nitrogen from. <coughs> it's there. You've killed it. It's laid flat. It's had soil some soil contact. Now your corn crop is canopied, and we've had some rain, so there's moisture. The microbes are saying, "I'm on fire, baby. I got everything I need to eat here." You know, there's plenty of carbohydrate in the in the center of these stalks let's hollow that shit out the roots they're breaking down because most of the nutrients are in the roots and they're breaking down and that corn crop or soybean crop is just like 
it's growing roots. If you're on 30 inch centers, it can grow roots right clear to the center of those rows. Now it's gonna have a little V there, but they will come up. I have seen white hairy roots come to the top of the surface of my soil and that in the center of those 30 inch rows. So life is good there. Twin rows would be better, but I'm, I don't have that capability. It's fine, whatever. All that biomass that has been breaking the break, been a, a rain break to keep it from, from uh, sealing off the top of the soil, allowing, and the worm holes, worm activity, very important. Those are channels for water to go down. They're channels for roots to go down very easily and quickly. They will put out, they'll put a taproot right down a wormhole. They're in a healthy microbiome. There's two, uh, was it 20 pounds? 20 pounds of phosphate produced in worm castings, available phosphate in the worm castings in a healthy microbiology. That water's gone down those wormholes, it's absorbing, and then, uh-oh, shit, we haven't had rain for three weeks. But that's okay, because we've got a healthy root system that can go very easily down to water, moist soil. Most soils, you dig down a foot in a drought, a foot, there's water down there. But there's this thing called a plow pan, six, eight inches deep. It's, 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 it's nice and soft, but then you get this plow pan that nothing can seem to penetrate. Worms penetrate that. Taproots penetrate that. No-till systems penetrate that. So you go down through that eight inch, six, eight inches, and there's water at a foot. No big deal. Those roots are gone for water. They're gone for water, and they will carry you through that. The canopy of biomass is going to keep the sun from evaporating the water out of the top eight inches of your soil anyway, and all that moisture is going to be going up the corn plant, out of the corn plant, pulling more nutrients that have been broken down and being broken down continually through the growing season by the microbiology. And I hope I've explained that well enough. I've been on here for over an hour, and I'm going to edit it. No, I'm not going to edit it, but just be aware. There's a lot of things out there that you can be doing. Change is inevitable. If we don't change voluntarily, these freaking libtard jackass politicians down in Washington are going to get en enough of these nuts and berry fruitcakes out there that are going to lobby and force us to change. I see it over the other side of the pond. I've seen it in other parts of the world. And it's coming here, whether you like it or not. Embrace the change. Do it on a small scale. Try it. Just say, hey, that one lonely farmer, he's a fucking idiot. But I'm going to take 20 acres, and I'm going to do this. And I'm going to see what I get. I'm going to see what I get. And eventually, after about 10 years, you more than likely will be able to reduce your inputs down to almost 10% of what you had put in before including herbicides and, and trips over the field is another one. Trips over the field are expensive. They cost you $10 an acre. Every time you cross that field, it's costing you $10 an acre, whether you like it or not. So reducing all those trips. Uh, plowing, disking, finishing. There's three trips. Those are $20 plus dollars per acre. 20 40 60 bucks. Wouldn't you rather have $60 in your pocket at the end of the year? I would. I certainly would, and I don't like maintaining equipment that does that I that I very rarely use. So, yeah, sixty bucks in my pocket versus sixty dollars in iron that I'll have to buy. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a nice day. I'll see you whenever.